pismom jeziku, tako da ću ja uvodnih samo dve, tri reči pređe na engleskom jeziku i odam ću dati reč našem dostu, pošto nije vam dali koji što vede kažem. Dear guests, Your Excellency, because we can hear the ambassador of Venezuela, Dear guests, dear students, dear professors, the Faculty of Law at the University of Belgrade, as well as uh, all the citizens of the Republic of Serbia, have a great pleasure and a great honor to have here with us uh, and among us uh, to greet and to welcome Sheikh Maulana Imran Nazar Hussein, one of the greatest uh, Islamic scholars and certainly the greatest expert uh, for Islamic eschatology. And he will today give a lecture about the Islamic eschatology, out of which you can learn about the eschatology itself, uh, about Islam, about uh, many aspects of geopolitical situation nowadays, and about reasons why we uh, Christians and Christian Orthodox especially uh, should uh, develop and maintain a good and brotherly relation with the Islamic world. So I get the uh, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. We begin with Allah's blessed name. We praise Him and we glorify Him as He ought to be praised and glorified. And we pray for peace and for blessings on all His noble messengers, on our father Adam, our father Abraham, on Moses, on Jesus, and on his mother, the Blessed Virgin Mary, and on the last of them all, the Prophet Muhammad. I thank you for your kind invitation to be here today. I greet you and I greet our distinguished guests, the uh, Dean of the Faculty of Law, uh, who I guess is busy at this time, Professor Sima Varomovic, uh, my chairman and dear brother, uh, Professor Branko Rabi, Rek Rekic, uh, the Mufti of Belgrade, who has uh, honored us with his presence, uh, Her Excellency, the Ambassador of Venezuela, I am from Trinidad and Tobago, so she's my neighbor. Uh, your former Minister of Foreign Affairs, uh, Dr. Zivadi Janabal Rich, excuse my pronunciation, my brothers and sisters and students. This is a special moment. It is a happy moment, and I give thanks to the one God who oh, made it possible for me to be with you, and I'm here for one basic purpose. I don't want to conceal it, I want it to be known plain and clear that I'm here to participate in a very humble way in building friendship and alliance between our two peoples, between the world of Islam and that world of Christianity in which a man cannot marry a man and get a marriage certificate. <laughs> We will persist 
in this humble effort and pray that it will be blessed with success. We are looking back at five to six hundred years of painful history. And if after five to six hundred years of such painful history, Imran can come to Belgrade and receive a welcome which is not only respectful but also affectionate. We say this has to have been ordained from above. That our two people, whether they like it or they don't, will draw closer to each other. In Spanish ambassador they say, que sera, sera. But in Serbia they say, sta bude Bridget. <laughs> what is Islamic eschatology? It's a very important subject. If we are to If we are to understand the reality of the world, one day the earth will speak. And on that day the earth will speak. In Arabic, Yawm Aidin to Hadis And on that day we will know that they were telling lies, monstrous lies. For example, about 9-11. <laughs> that is the end of the world. And there will be resurrection and judgment. And there will be heaven for those who still have spiritual innocence. But if you lose your spiritual innocence, you cannot enter heaven. And then there will be punishment for the others. That's the end of the world. But we are concerned with something else. We're concerned about the end of history. When the historical process will end, will culminate with an event in which truth will triumph over all rivals and justice will prevail over injustice and oppression. That's the end of history. And in the Christian world, you know that history will end with the return of the son of the Virgin Mary, the true Messiah. But in the Muslim world, history will end with the return of the true Messiah the son of the Virgin Mary, exactly the same. But they don't tell you though, about that on CNN. <laughs> they don't tell you about that in the New York Times. Indeed, a Jew also believes that history will end with the return, sorry. The Jew also believes that history will end when the Messiah comes. But we will return to that in a moment. But there are others, a very strange and mysterious people who don't believe in an end. No. They believe that they were created as an elite 
They are superior. And they were empowered by a scientific and technological revolution. And they used that power to wage war. And Belgrade knows about that war. And to colonize the rest of the world. Not just to colonize, no. They said that we have come to civilize you. What arrogance. And arrogance has no place in true religion. They impose their brutal rule over the rest of the world. Their bloody rule over the rest of the world. They were oppressors. And oppression has no place in the religious way of life. They are those who today control power, political power, economic power through the banking system, monetary power through their, let me choose my words carefully, through their bogus and fraudulent monetary system. Hugo Chavez understood it. Oh yes. And Hugo Chavez attempted to take Venezuela out of the IMF. But he couldn't do it. No, it was too difficult. There are people who believe that they have come on the stage of the world to remain there forever. <coughs> there is nothing to come after them. No. I am revealing to you what is in their hearts. There are people who believe that every civilization that came before is now moribund. Absolute like your laptop computer that you bought 10 years ago. That every civilization that came before now belongs to the museums of history. That is their arrogance. And so they don't have any conception of an end. No. They believe we're here forever. And that is the heart of a godless people. And a godless world order that we have today. With this introduction, let me proceed. Both Christianity and Islam recognize Jesus, the son of Mary, the son of the Virgin Mary, as the true Messiah. That he came and he left and that he is coming back one day. And that is the most important event which now remains to occur in history. Unfortunately for Judaism, for the majority, overwhelming majority of those who subscribe to the Jewish faith, from that day to this day, they have rejected, yes, rejected Jesus, the son of Mary, as the true Messiah. Indeed, it's more than that. They don't believe 
that he was born of a virgin mother. We, we believe that, and you believe that, but they don't. And so, they're still waiting for the Messiah to come. Because they know that the Lord God is not like Washington. When the Lord God gives his word, he keeps his word. And so they're waiting for the Messiah to come. And we are waiting, and you are waiting, for the Messiah to return. And this is the heart of eschatology. When the Messiah comes, they say, he will come to rule the world with justice. And we say, and you say, that when the Messiah returns, he will return to rule the world with justice. So it's the same thing. But the true Messiah will return. So who are they waiting for? when they rejected him. Our prophet said, and now this is Islamic eschatology. This is the heart of Islamic eschatology. Our prophet said, Allah's blessings be upon him. That before the true Messiah comes, or rather comes back, there will be a false Messiah. In Jesus, the son of Mary, appearance and reality are always different. When he was born, it appeared to them. He was a bastard. And he said so. <laughs> but the reality was different. He was the son of a virgin mother. When he left the world, again appearance and reality were different. And I have to climb this mountain, so let me climb it now. Then we can see with the lecture. You know what I'm going to say. They were convinced when they saw him die on the cross. He is dead. He could not have been the Messiah. He never ruled the world. And look at how he died. <laughs> the book of God says that whosoever dies that way is the cursed of the Lord most high. And so now, we are vindicated. This is evidence that we are right. He could not have been the Messiah. He is dead. But appearance and reality was again opposite to each other. The Quran has told us that the Lord God sends the angel to take the soul. But when we are asleep, the angel takes the soul, and then for those for whom death is written, the Lord God keeps the soul. And the others are sent back for a prescribed period of time, which is why our chairman is still with us. <coughs> he takes the soul and keeps the soul of those for whom death is written. And for the others, the soul is sent back for a period of time. 
So that does not qualify as death. And the Quran tells us this is what happened. Had I been there, I would also have said, he's dead. Yes, because that's what we saw. But the Quran says that Allah made it appear to them. And so, what actually happened was, yes, the soul was taken. Oh, yes. And the body was taken down. Oh, yes. And the body was prepared for funeral. And the body was placed according to your sources in the cave and sealed. Everything is the same. And then the soul was returned. And you would not know that and I would not know that. But it's there in the book. And then he was raised. <coughs> Can you come over here? And so appearance and reality were opposite to each other. And then he was raised. And one day he's coming back. And when the time comes for him to come back again, appearance and reality will be opposite to each other. Because before he comes back, there's one who is to come, who will seek to impersonate the true Messiah. And you call him the Antichrist. And the Prophet called him al masih dajjal the child, the false messiah. In order for the messiah to rule the world from Jerusalem, number one, he would have to liberate the Holy Land. Number two, he would have to bring the Israelite people back to the Holy Land to reclaim it as their own. Number three, he would have to restore the Holy State of Israel, the one that was created by David and by Solomon. Allah's blessing be upon you. That was one, two, three. You count it? Number four. He'd have to cause that Israel to become the ruling state in the world. And then he can claim to be the Messiah, ruling the world. In what sense of the word do we use ruling the world? Not in the sense of ruling over every square inch of Belgrade. No. Ruling the world in the sense that there is no rival that can challenge his authority and his rule. In that sense. So now, put on your thinking caps. If the Antichrist is to successfully impersonate the true Messiah, does it not follow logically that he would have to liberate the Holy Land for the Jews? After all, he has to convince them that he is the Messiah, convince them, the Jews. So, would it not follow logically for oh, university students, you can follow me. Would it not follow logically that he'd have to liberate the Holy Land for the Jews? After all, the Holy Land is on the Muslim road. Has he done that as yet? Number two, 
Would it not follow logically that he'd have to bring the Jews back to the Holy Land to reclaim it as their own 2,000 years after they were expelled and their return was banned? Would it not follow logically? Has he done that as yet? Has he brought them back as yet? While you were having Turkish coffee? Number three. Would it not follow logically that the Antichrist would have to restore a state of Israel in the Holy Land and convince the Jews that this is Holy Israel when it would be an imposter? Has he done that as yet? While we were having coffee? I want to tickle your intellect. I want to get you to think the Lord God created us as a people who can think. Cows cannot think. Donkeys cannot think. The mountains cannot think. But human beings can think. And when he sent down the revelation, he sent it down to a people who think. And I invite you to think. Would it not follow logically if he is to successfully impersonate the Messiah, then he'd have to cause that state of Israel to become the ruling state in the world. <laughs> Has that happened, is it? Or is it around the corner while we are having Turkish coffee? From my eschatology, you cannot explain. You cannot explain. The British Army liberating, quote unquote, Jerusalem in 1917 and liberating the Holy Land, quote unquote, for the Jews without this eschatology. You cannot explain the return of the Jews from everywhere. Sometimes they came on their own, but most times they were pushed. Come back to the Holy Land. 2,000 years after they were expelled. You cannot explain that. You can use all your tools of political analysis. You cannot do it. We say it is eschatology that explains it. We say you cannot explain the restoration of the state of Israel in the Holy Land 2,000 years after the Lord God had destroyed it using your tools of political analysis. No. We say it is eschatology that explains the restoration of the state of Israel in the Holy Land. And so we are understanding history. We are connecting the dots of history. And as a consequence of that, we can anticipate history. They can't do it in their political science departments. No. But we can anticipate what is to come because we are connecting the dots of history. That's eschatology, Excellency. That's eschatology. So what is it to come? Our eschatology tells us that the Antichrist was re released into the world in the lifetime of the last prophet. Not only was he released into the world, but also the Gog and Magog were released into the world in the lifetime of the prophet. Allah's blessing be upon you. We cannot, in this lecture, explain to you the totality of the subject of Gog and Magog and of the Antichrist of the Jah. But suffice to say that 
prophet said that when the Dajjal is released, that's the Antichrist, he will live on earth for 40 days. One day which would be like a year, one day which would be like a month, one day which would be like a week, and all the rest of his days like your days. When his day is like our day, he would be in our world of space and time. So we can see him. He would have to be a human being. He has to rather appear as a human being. Because the Messiah is a human being. He has to be more than that. He has to be a Jew. Yes. He has to be a Jew. Otherwise, no Jew would accept him as the Messiah. More than that. We have to know his family background, his antecedents. We have to know who was his father and his mother and his grandfather and his grandmother because the, 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 the Messiah must come from the house of David. And his son. That is when he is our, in our world of space and time. We should not be long from now. But prior to that, he would not be in our world of space and time, although he is here. Are there angels? In this room? Of course they are. Yes. Can you see them? No. There are angels here. You can't see them. The Quran speaks about another creation called the jinn. They're created of fire. Are there jinn here? I know there are lots in Washington. Are there jinn here? Yes. Can you see them? No, because they're not in our world of space and time, but they're here. Can you see Satan? No, but he's here. And so when the Antichrist is released, he is here, but you can't see him. And he passes through three stages, three stages of his existence. And one day when Imran gets a chance to study Christian eschatology, some scholar of Christian eschatology would be explained, would explain to me 666, 660 and 6, whether there's a parallel between the two. And I'm looking forward to study Christian eschatology. He has to pass through three stages before he emerges in human form. Where will he be when he is released on earth? Our sources in Islam tell us it's going to be an island. It's going to be an island about one month's journey by sea from the Arab world. Going to be an island with a PhD in deception and espionage, you know, James Bond kind of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> a PhD in deception and in espionage. It's going to be an island where the monastery will be in ruins. It will be McDonald's and burgers. Indeed, an atheist, essentially atheist way of life. In that island, is it Singapore? Eh? Or is it Reunion Island? <laughs> no, it's Britain. From this island, he commences his effort to rule the world from Jerusalem. So now connect the dots of history. Britain mysteriously emerges as a ruling state. They call it Pax Britannica. But the dean of the faculty of law 
of the University of Belgrade say it was in Pax at all. <laughs> it was better. They call it Pax Britannica. Napoleon looked at that island off the coast of Europe contemptuously. He said it's a nation of shopkeepers. Oh, but that island became the ruling state in the world. And at the launch of the First World War in 1914, Britain controlled every single important naval base on the whole earth. Is that by accident? Can you explain that using your tools of political analysis? No, you can't. It's our eschatology, what you think. That's the importance of this subject. Britain it was which issued the Balfour Declaration. That it was His Majesty's intention to establish a Jewish national home in the Holy Land. The commentary that came afterwards, of course, was that these are a people without a home. And all that we are doing is to try to provide them with a home. That was a monstrous lie. They didn't create Israel so that a Jewish diaspora would have a place to live. No, that was a lie. They created Israel to rule the world. It was from Britain that we saw the effort being made not only to create a holy Israel, not only to liberate the Holy Land for the Jews and to bring the Jews back to the Holy Land to reclaim it. But it's from Britain we saw a scientific and technological revolution emerging. It didn't come from Disneyland. It didn't fall from the heaven by accident. No, it's a concrete fact of history. There is nothing in the antecedents which can explain the emergence of this spectacular phenomenon of a scientific and technological revolution which is still not yet finished, not yet finished. Which was unlike anything that history had ever, ever seen. What is the explanation? And the scientific and technological revolution gave them a military power with which to be able to brutally occupy the rest of the world. And they used their power to oppress. It came from Britain. Our eschatology locates Gog and Magog there. Gog and Magog are creatures, human beings, created by the Lord God, but endowed with a power that none can destroy. And they are good people. No. They are a people who corrupt every single thing that they touch. And they corrupt it in such a way as to destroy it. And so even the good earth is now being destroyed. And so, it was Gog and Magog that we faced when the armies came to India and to Africa. But you'll be surprised, Belgrade. You'll be surprised, Serbia, because from my eschatology, at the Battle of Kosovo, you faced Gog and Magog. It was Gog and Magog which defeated you in the Battle of Kosovo in 1989. 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13
And it is time for Islamic eschatology to explain what has not been explained so far. And I'm grateful for the opportunity to do so in Belgrade. It was Gog and Magog in the Battle of Kosovo. And you could have marshaled all the armed forces that you had. You could never have secured victory. No. You face Gog and Magog. And you have continued to face Gog and Magog since then. From Britain came not only the scientific and technological revolution, from Britain came the monetary system of bogus and fraudulent money with the creation of the Bank of England. But I don't have the time to take you down that road today. When God created the male and the female, he said, I created them the way I created the night and the day. He says so in the Quran. But I created the male and the female the way I created the night and the day. Excuse my language, will you? Which fool would put an equal sign between the male and the female? Which fool would put an equal sign between the night and the day? That the day is equal to the night and the night is equal to the day. Oh my gosh, what foolishness. No. The day and the night are two halves which cannot exist without each other. The day and the night are not equal to each other. Stop that rubbish. The day and the night are complementary to each other. They come together to make a whole. And if the day is not day, and the night is not night, everything will be spoiled. But from England came a modern feminist revolution. And that feminist revolution declared that religion is being an oppressor. All religions have oppressed women already. So Abraham was an oppressor already. And Moses was an oppressor already. I didn't know that. Thank you, Washington, for telling me. <laughs> and we are going to liberate women. This is a new age for women. The age of women's liberation. And so, from Britain it started, the effort to take the night and make it day. And at the end of it all, when they've destroyed her, she doesn't even look like a woman anymore. Her face is masculine. Her voice is masculine. She does not have the shyness and the bashfulness of a woman. No! She become a man, she's masculine. And then they say to her, you've come a long way, baby. <laughs> That's Britain. That's Britain. But Bucks Britannica did not come to remain forever. And one day, a mysterious transition took place. They went across the sea to create a new world out there. And they committed genocide. And this is about the most appropriate time for me to talk about genocide. I hope Bosnia is listening, and Albania is listening, and Kosovo is listening, and Macedonia is listening, and Montenegro is listening, because you need to listen. 
It is genocide that the world experienced out there. That was genocide. When they exterminated the American Indian people, like cockroaches. Why? They're not human beings. We are the chosen of the Lord Most High. We are the elite. These are less than human. We have to civilize the world. How many were they who went to the New World, who protested against the killing and the slaughter of the American Indians? No one? Very few. And so they were collectively guilty. And that was genocide. So don't come to teach me what is genocide. No. That's not your role, the Security Council of the United Nations, to teach me what is genocide. Thank God for Russia. Yes, indeed. I'm not scripted by anyone. No one is paying me to speak this way or that way. Forget it. I say, thank God for Russia, who vetoed the resolution, because it was not genocide. Now, the Serbian people did not support the slaughter of people. They condemned it. So go and find who are those who are responsible for it and condemn them. But if that resolution had been adopted, you could have said goodbye, oh yes, to any possibility of friendship and alliance between Muslims and Christians. And so I applauded Russia. They went across the sea to build a new heaven, a shining star in the world. My gosh, it looks as though the sun was rising from the west. And Pax Americana came into being. And the United States now takes over the sky as Britain took the sea. And we were told, of course, about the Antichrist, that he will rise on a donkey. You know that. The prophet said that he will come on a donkey, uh, and the donkey will travel as fast as the clouds, and the donkey will have his head stretched out wide. The Salafi in Isis is still waiting for the flying donkey. <laughs> that Protestant version of Islam, which gave us ISIS, believes in the literal interpretation of the text. It's a textbook religion that they have. But we recognize the flying donkey to be already here. I took the flying donkey from Geneva to come to Belgium. <laughs> and once, once they had control of the sky, control of the sky, they were on their way to controlling the world. Because suddenly, a ship is no longer used to travel. No, now a ship is called a cruise ship. <laughs> and so all of mankind except the periphery is traveling with a flying donkey. And once you fly with a flying donkey, it's much easier now to monitor movement and monitor people. And then comes the, the camera at immigration, and the fingerprints, and, and uh, whatever, and whatever, and whatever. It's like the, the whole world has become a police state now. This is Pax Americana, control of the sky. 
In the same way that on the eve of the First World War, Britain controlled every single strategically important naval state in the whole world, so to today, the United States of America has so many bases around the world. I lost count of them. The last one I heard about, almost as big as the one in Germany, Yes, in Kosovo. So now you know why they bombed the daylights out of Belgrade. Now you know why. The United States of America maintains a mysterious relationship with Israel, which cannot be explained by normal tools of political analysis. No, endless vetoes in the Security Council so that Israel can continue to grow and grow and grow and grow. Transfer of nuclear technology, transfer of resources, of wealth, and the US dollar becomes, of course, the international currency. And Bretton Woods comes along to give the US dollar that supreme importance, but we don't have the time to take you down that road today. And the United States is not only the wealthiest country in the world, but also the most powerful in the world. And if you don't draw the line, we can destroy you. So praise God for Hugo Chavez. Yes, who stood up like a man and defied him. Praise God for Hugo Chavez and for Hugo Morales. And now we are located at that moment in time from our eschatological perspective that we can anticipate what they cannot. That Pax Americana is now in irreversible decline. That the US dollar is now in irreversible decline. How can we speak like this? Is it an angel talking to us? Is it revelation that's coming? No, it's not. It is political analysis based on eschatology. That is what it is. But in the same way that Pax Americana replaced Pax Britannica, so too there must be a replacement for Pax Americana because it's three stages. Stage one, stage two, stage three, and then the Antichrist appears in human form. So who is it going to be to replace the United States? Is it China? Is it China? <laughs> no. Between the Pax Britannica and Pax Americana, the transition could not take place without great wars. Was unprecedented in magnitude. And so too between Pax Americana and that which is to come, there must be even greater wars. And we are now at the door of the greatest war of all. Our eschatology allows us to see what they cannot as yet see. For them, it's a guessing game, but we know it. It is Pax Judaica that must replace Pax Americana. Israel must replace the United States. But how can Israel rule the world when Israel is so small and the world is so big? Either. Israel must expand and become very big, or the world, yes, the world must become smaller. <coughs> How can the world become smaller? They want it to become smaller. The answer is that the pieces are already in place when Russia entered militarily into Syria. Russia will not back out. No.
wish I did not want nuclear war. I'm sure. And the United States of America much prefers to fight Libya <laughs> to fight a nuclear power. So the US armed forces also, they don't want nuclear war. And that's why they're talking to each other to try to prevent a clash between the two titans. But there's someone who does want nuclear war. And he has a PhD in deception. So we can close our eyes and anticipate the mother of all false flag attacks coming. And then this one will blame that one, or that one will blame this one, and the nuclear war will take place. Christian eschatology calls it Armageddon. And in Islamic eschatology, it's called the Malhama. We know about it. And we know that most of mankind will perish, but mostly in North America and Europe. What is left of the world after that would be manageable for Israel. We know that the monetary system is going. Paper money is not going to last for long again. And before I proceed, may I ask you, uh, when Jesus comes back, would he be using US dollars or euros? You laughing over it, huh? When Jesus comes back, would he be using British pounds? Huh? No. You know it. Yes. But when Jesus comes back, he will be using money which is sound money, which is good money, which is money with integrity, which is money created by the Lord God, which is money which was always used in history, which is money which was used by all the prophets of God. A gold coin and a silver coin. Money with intrinsic value. And the Antichrist cannot rule from Jerusalem and get any Jew to accept him if Israel is not using gold and silver as money. Huh? Well, I have news for you. Israel is already minting gold and silver coins. I have news for you. While we are drinking Turkish coffee, Israel has already made gold and silver coins, a legal tender. Oh yes. But in between the two, the collapse of paper money and the restoration of gold and silver, what is there in between? Yes, you know it. It is money that you can't see. Huh? What did you say? Money you can't see. Money you can't touch. Money you can't take out of the bank and put it in your pocket and go home. Huh? Electronic money? Digital money? Who else except one with the intellectual acumen? Excuse my language. Who else but one with the intellectual acumen of a jackass? <laughs> Would accept such money. You can't see it, you can't touch it. <clears throat> That's what's coming. And that is the financial Guantanamo that Hugo Chavez was trying to escape from when he attempted to take Venezuela out of the IMF, but could not. I want to end because my intention today is only to whet your appetite. So you can't sleep tonight. <laughs> that you want knowledge, real knowledge. That you want to be able to connect the dots of history. That you want to be able to understand the past and penetrate the reality of t today and anticipate tomorrow. That's what you want. What happens after the big war? I was surprised 
Two years ago, I was invited by the State University of Moscow to lecture. And I spoke on Islamic eschatology. On my right side was Professor Alexander Dugin, but on my left side was Russia's most eminent eschatologist sitting next to me. And when I was finished, he looked at me and he smiled. And he said, there is so much in common between our eschatology and yours. And then I learned for the first time, I did not know it. In our eschatology, we know that after the big war that's coming, which will give Dukhan, smoke, one of the signs, smoke, meaning the mushroom clouds. You won't have any sunlight. Maybe three days, I think, no sunlight. After the Malchama or Armageddon, the next significant event to occur would be the conquest of Constantinople. So you can tell Sultan Muhammad Fatih, tell him for me, that when he claimed to be the one who has fulfilled the prophecy of Prophet Muhammad, Allah's blessings be upon him, that he will conquer Constantinople. Sultan, that is false. Tell the Turkish people for me if they're willing to listen. I don't know whether they want to listen or not. That the conquest of Constantinople prophesied by Prophet Muhammad, Allah's blessings be upon him, comes after the big war. After Armageddon. After the Malhamah. It has not occurred as yet. And so that was a bogus claim. Corrupting eschatology. That's what the Ottoman Empire was. Created by Dajjal and empowered by Kak and Magog. Let me repeat that. So it's recorded. The Ottoman Empire was created by Dajjal to do his dirty work for him. And I choose my words with great care. And the Ottoman Empire was empowered by Gog and Magog. No, the rest, the conquest of Constantinople is still to come. And it is eschatology that tells us that. No political science department anywhere in the world. No department of strategic studies knows about it. No. The conquest of Constantinople is still to come. And it comes after the big war. Why, I asked myself, why this conquest of Constantinople? What, what relevance does it have to the events in the Holy Land where history will climax and culminate? And I got only one answer. That when Constantinople is conquered, the back of NATO will be broken and the city will be free. And the implication would be that the Russian Navy will now be able to pass through the Bosphorus and the Straits of Danvers unhindered and entered into the Mediterranean Sea. And so when Russia reclaimed Crimea, oh yes, Imran celebrated. I celebrated when Russia reclaimed Crimea because I know from Crimea to the conquest of Constantinople is a straight line. <laughs> a straight line. NATO, you can take that and put it in your pipe and smoke it. <laughs> <laughs> choose my words with great care. 
I am not reckless with my tongue. The most disgraceful event, the most shameful event in our history, or one of the most disgraceful and shameful events in our history as a Muslim people, was when Sultan Muhammad Fatih took the cathedral of Hagia Sophia, which had functioned as the supreme cathedral of Orthodox Christianity for 1,000 years, and shamefully and disgracefully and manifestly sinfully transformed it into a masjid. On that day, when Constantinople is conquered, we will return that cathedral to you. <laughs> Time does not permit me to take you to the Quran. Time does not put, permit me to take you to our sources for which, on which I base my statement. But on that day, not only will we return the cathedral to you, but we'll offer an apology to you for 500 years of disgrace and shame on the world of Islam. And that's not all. No, there's more. Our prophet, Allah's blessing be upon him, called the city by the name Constantinople. And that is the name that will be restored to it. They can do what they want. They can say what they want. They cannot stop it. And then a Muslim Christian alliance will do the rest. The Holy Land will be liberated of oppressors. No, we're not talking about anti-Jewish relations, no. If a Jew stands up against the oppressor, he is my brother. So this is not anti-Semitism. Take that and throw it out of the window. This is a common alliance between Christians and Muslims to teach the oppressor a lesson that he will never forget. And with that, history will end. The Holy Land will be liberated. And truth will triumph over all rivals. And justice will triumph over injustice and oppression in the world. And with this, I thank you for being so patient with me.
The method by which we must approach the subject of relations between Muslims and Christians, Muslims and Jews, and so on, is that we must return to our primary source, which is the Quran. I'm glad that you asked the question because it gives me a chance to take you to the Quran. In the fifth chapter of the Quran, Surah Al-Ma'idah, Allah speaks about Christians and Muslims and Jews. And He says that in time to come, you will find that those who will have the greatest hatred and enmity and hostility for you would be Jews, but not all Jews, no, no. And in addition to Jews, those whose foundation is based on blasphemy, you know, the Lord God has prohibited homosexuality, and they say, no, we can legalize the marriage of a man with a man. Now the man that is blasphemy. So you'll find these two people to be showing the greatest hatred and enmity, war on Islam. But the verse goes on to say that you will find those who will be closest in love and affection for you Muslims would be a people who say we are Christians. Which Christians is the Quran talking about? It goes on to tell us that there would be a Christian people who are still holding on to monasticism. There are a Christian people who are still holding on to the institution of the priesthood and monasticism. So amongst them you will see the monastery still surviving and still held in esteem. And then it goes on to say that they would be a Christian people who would not be arrogant. No. Well, I expect people. When we look at the Christian world today, we see one part of the Christian world which still looks Christian. Yes. But another part of the Christian world where the monastery is now pizza hut. And the monastery is now McDonald's hamburgers. And that part of the Christian world displays an arrogance unprecedented in history. Yes. And so we recognize that the Quran is speaking about Orthodox Christianity, the people who are in this room. In the Quran, they are referred to as Rum. Rum. We have the Mufti here. So if I make a mistake, he'll correct me, won't he? In the Quran, they are referred to as Rum. And in the Quran, there is a surah or chapter entitled Rum, which is Orthodox Christianity, Byzantium. And in the beginning of that chapter or surah, the Quran makes mention that Rum was defeated in a land close by. But Rome will be victorious in just a few years' time by Allah's command. We not say Allah with Allah's help. And on that day when Rome is victorious, you Muslims will celebrate. It's in the Quran. It is in the Quran. So the Quran has a positive place for Orthodox Christianity. So if we are to educate the people of this region after 500 years of barbarian oppression, 
We have to go to the Quran to teach them. That's the only way. You can't stop friendship between Orthodox Christians and Muslims. Don't try. Free, free, buddhi, bichit. Start buddhi bichit. And uh, in another verse, which is in the same chapter, the Quran prohibits Muslims, prohibits Muslims from entering into friendship and alliance with such Christians and such Jews who are friends and allies of each other. The Quran is anticipating a mysterious reconciliation and the emergence of a Judeo-Christian friendship and alliance which today has come into me with Zionist Christians and Zionist Jews who have NATO as their military arm. You are prohibited. Are you listening to me, Bosnia? You are prohibited from entering into their embrace, being friends and allies of such people. Are you listening to me, Bosnia? And if you do, Whosoever from amongst you turn to them with friendship and alliance, you belong to them, you no longer belong to us. So the answer to your question is that the process of education has to be founded on the Book of God, the Quran. before you wage war. 
so you can declare a legal state of war without fighting. Without fighting. And he said, when the time for fighting comes, when you face the enemy on the battlefield, wait until he kills one of your men. And then take the body and place it in front of them and ask, is there no, is there no better way for us to resolve the problem? We are prepared to accept the loss of one of our men to avoid fighting. So this is jihad, a just war. I don't have a question for our um, Shai. I only want to say something that uh, in the history, all the conflict between different people for different religion, behind that conflict is an economical interest, a political interest. Uh, the imperialism and the Zionism all the time are using the different religion to get something. It is not true that it's very difficult to be Christian in the Muslim countries. No, Christian and Muslim in the in the, are living very nice together in a Muslim country. When we, when begin some problem, you can be sure that behind that problem, the imperialism and the Zionism are using the religion. If I may add a word to what Her Excellency has just said. It would not be as Christian and Muslim living together in peace and harmony. No, for a thousand years, Jews and Muslims <laughs> The last golden age of Jewish civilization came under Muslim rule. Moses, Maimonides came under Muslim rule. And the present sorry mess has come because of the Antichrist and Gog and Magog. could have had a Christian eschatology for hundreds of years now. And the Jews could have had a Jewish eschatology for a long, 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 long time. It was not possible for Islamic eschatology to emerge as an independent branch of knowledge. Not possible. Until an event took place. So that kick off in a moment. All of this material was studied as a part of hadith. 
حديث This is very clear. آخر الزمان فاضل حديث. But to go to the Quran and then from the Quran to go to the Hadith and to combine them and integrate them together and then apply that to history and to politics and to economics and to monetary economics, which is what we've been doing, was not possible until an event took place. Let me share with you that event and then we can have a nice cup of coffee. When Pharaoh was drowning, underneath the water. He realized that he was not God. And the Quran tells us that underneath the water he declared his faith in the God of Moses. The Lord God then responded and said, Alan, now Pharaoh, and before this you were in rejection, in arrogant rejection. And you were corrupting the land, destroying the people. This day, we have ordained, divine ordained, divinely ordained, the preservation of your physical body. The preservation of your physical body. <laughs> so that this physical body of yours, when in time to come, it is discovered, when it resurfaces in the historical process, that would be a sign, a sign that's why we are preserving the body. So that when that body is discovered, it will be a sign for a people to come after you. لِتَكُونَ لِمَنْ خَلْفَكَ آيَةً What is the sign? Answer. When the body is fit, Pharaoh is discovered, as it was at the same time when the Zionist movement was established, about the same time the two things happened, the history will now repeat itself. And that the people who live the way Pharaoh lived, with arrogance, godlessness, oppressing the people, will die the way he died. Yes, that they will be destroyed by divine intervention. At that time it was strike the water with your rod, Moses. But this time around it will be that the son of the Virgin Mary will come down with his hands resting on the wings of two angels. And when he comes down, you're going to suffer the same fate that Pharaoh and his army suffered. The body of Pharaoh was discovered in 1897, 98, somewhere around there. And from that moment now, events are unfolding in the historical process, political and economic and monetary and so on which allows us to now understand the Qur'an and understand the Hadith. And so Islamic eschatology could not have emerged as an independent branch of knowledge before now.
that is very good. The second, we are talking about Orthodox Christians and Christians. So may I say they also talk about Orthodox Muslim and Muslim. So the parallel is obvious. Quran and Bible. It's not religious document. It's history of humanity. If we are clever, the not So, what we are talking about now, we are talking about typical, huge manipulation. What does it mean to have? In your opinion, in your definition, and we have the definition of some water guy who is crazy of everything. First of them are Okay, so that is the question. The question is, is a thing. Orthodox Muslims and Muslims like Orthodox Christians and Christians. Thank you. Christianity came in two stages. In the first stage, there is a breakup, with one part going west and the other part remaining here. That's the first stage. The second stage came when that part which went west was attacked to destroy the spiritual heart of the religion. So that what remained was a textbook Christianity, better known as Protestant Christianity. When you destroy the spiritual heart of the religion, then what remains will be people who have eyes and yet cannot see. Internally blind. The prophet said about the Antichrist, that he sees with only one eye. He is blind in the other eye. It looks like a bulging brick, but your Lord is not one eye. For some, they will be waiting for a man to stand up in Jerusalem to say, I am the Messiah, and he would not be the son of Mary. And he would be the child, but they would say, no, this cannot be the child because he has two eyes. Because they have missed the book. Religious symbolism. When you lose the spiritual heart of religion, you, you are no longer capable of penetrating religious symbolism. When the prophet said that the child sees with his left eye, and he's blind in the right eye, what he meant by that was that Dajjal has external sight and that he's internally blind. And that's what happened to Western Christianity, Protestant Christianity. And so you find so many of them now accepting that a man can marry another man and get a marriage certificate. And when we stand up against it, they tell us that we have a disease. We are suffering from a disease called homophobia. The same thing is happening in Islam. That in Islam you had the same attack. And from the heart of Islam has now emerged a Protestant Islam, or textbook religion, incapable of penetrating to the reality of things. And so every tune that Dajjal plays on his drums, they dance to it. 
because they have eyes and yet cannot see. That's the tragedy of today. But we hope and we pray that there will be in Orthodox Christianity and in Islam those who will be able to see with the internal eye and to penetrate the reality of the world today, to anticipate what is coming tomorrow, and to join hands in a common struggle against the oppressor. century. The major obstacle is the process of secularization which hinders and obstructs your effort to return to religious sources for knowledge. Monetary economics and he, Imran, is bringing the Quran into the classroom of monetary economics. Is he mad or is he crazy? Huh? That's the answer. But that's what I did. I took the Quran across in my heart. I took it into the classroom of monetary economics and into the classroom of politics and diplomacy and of history of international relations. I took the Quran with me and I was able to understand so if you can remove the obstacles and return to your roots. And one of the reasons why I'm here in Serbia is to, to take a look at your hearts. You know. I want to see your hearts. I want to see where your hearts are turned to. Because there's a looming confrontation in the world now between NATO and Russia. And Russia is returning to Orthodox Christianity. Russia is returning to her spiritual roots. Russia has a spiritual heart. And their heart is barbarian and godless. So is your heart lusting for Paris and Washington and London and Bonn and the European Union? Or is your heart turned in the direction of the one whose foundation is spiritual and who is standing up to the oppressor? Hmm? In addition to looking at your hearts, I want to look at your hands as well. Yes, I'm watching you. In Orthodox Christianity, as in Hinduism, as in Buddhism, as in Islam, when men and women greeted each other, you would courtesy offer a smile. Huh? So from where came shaking of hands? And kissing on this cheek and kissing on that cheek. When, when, when will you wash yourself off? Wash yourself off and stop imitating blindlessly a godless and decadent civilization and return to your Christian roots. If I have to come to make you a better Christian, I will do it. What is the right religion? Answer. Answer. Religion is founded on truth. Truth has 
zero tolerance for oppression. So look to see, where are they in the world today who are standing up against the oppressors like Hugo Chavez? And you'll find amongst them true religion. Religion not only has zero tolerance for oppression, but religion as truth must be able to explain. Explain reality. Explain history. And anticipate tomorrow. If you have the truth, with that truth you can connect the dots of history. You can read history as it ought to be written, not as they wrote it with the Ottoman Empire. If you have the truth, you will understand the reality of the world today. And if you have the truth, you'll be able to anticipate tomorrow. And that's why you and I are coming together. States of America. No. Why do you think Hugo Chavez was sending oil to the people, the poor in the United States? He was sending oil to them. Yeah. So too with Britain, so too with France. In fact, I have to tell you, I have more fans in France listening to me than I have in Trinidad. Um, I said that the night and the day complement each other. They're like two halves which cannot exist independent of each other. The night and the day must come together, which of course is a bell for those of you who are not yet married. The night and the day must come together to form a whole. And then you see the beauty of what the Lord created. So they are complementary to each other. And you don't put an equal sign between them. No. What the Antichrist has done is to attempt to take the night and transform her into day. Okay? And our prophet has spoken about something more. He said not only will women dress like men, 
And they're only doing that now. I've seen them with jackets and ties. And trousers. Jackets and ties and trousers. But he said that men will dress like women. <coughs> men will dress like women. Indicating a reversal of roles with which history will end. He said that women will be dressed and yet naked, indicating a sexual revolution which will end up with the destruction of the family. You don't have the family, you're going to have chaos. You don't have the family, you're going to have violence in your society. Your society will collapse if you don't have the family. And when you have women dressed and yet naked, and a sexual revolution around you, that's the end of the family. About good and evil, now that's a tougher subject philosophically. The Quran refers to evil as conduct in the context of conduct. It is more difficult for us to speak about evil metaphysically, ontologically. It is easier to speak about evil in the context of moral philosophy. Hmm? That you are given the choice as human beings to choose to either go the right way, the way of virtue, or to go the way of sin, of evil. That is a choice which is given to us. Whether or not evil exists metaphysically as an entity or itself is not a subject I think I want to take up in this session. But the Quran does speak about the creation of evil and let me just mention it and then we'll stop. Close to the end of the Quran, we are told Say, I seek refuge with the Lord God of the dawn from the evil which, which he has created. Evil which, which, which he has created. We cannot locate evil in animals. We cannot locate evil in trees and plants. No. We cannot locate evil in angels because angels cannot disobey. So where then can we locate evil? In creation only in human beings and in genes. But no human being was created evil. None. And no gene was created evil. None. Walakad karlamna bani Adam, says the Quran. We have honored the progeny of Adam. <coughs> well then, if no human being was created evil, no jinn was created evil, no angel was created evil, nothing in the plant world or the animal world was created evil, nothing in the material universe was created evil, well then where is the evil? Min sharri ma khalaq. My answer, my opinion, and the rule is when Imam gives his opinion, never accept it. <laughs> Until you're convinced that it is correct. Is that the Quran is referring to Dajjal, created as an evil being. And so when Jesus kills him, he'll pass into non-existence. So it's nonsense to say that Dajjal will also have a resurrection and he'll be subject to judgment and he'll be sent to heaven or to hell. No. When Jesus kills him, he will enter into non-existence. That's my opinion.
Yeah. 